Good day. Uh, we're going to continue with our discussion on adolescent medicine, and uh, we're going to be doing pediatric and adolescent gynecology. We'll talk about some of the definitions of normal, we'll, and then we'll go into uh, three specific diagnoses, dysmenorrhea, amenorrhea, and abnormal uterine bleeding, which used to be called dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Okay, before we can talk about abnormalities, we need to talk about what is normal. The age of menarche, of the first menstrual period, um, is 12.0 years in African American girls and 12.5 in white girls, a little bit less in Hispanic, about the same um, in uh, Asian girls. The interval of the onset of puberty, which is breast development, to menarche is two to two and a half years. The 95th percentile for that interval is four years. So if you know that somebody, in looking at your record, somebody's had breast development and it's five years ago and they still had had menarche, that is AB normal. Cycle length. So in the first one to two years after menarche, cycle length can be extremely variable because many of the cycles are anovulatory. Um, and uh, once they become ovulatory, the length of the cycle is somewhere between 21 and 34 days. As you know, the fixed part of the cycle is the luteal phase. The luteal phase is always 14 days. So the time of ovulation to menses is fixed at 14 days. The follicular phase is the one that's very variable and can be anywhere from seven to 20 days. Duration of menses is somewhere between three and seven days. Dysmenorrhea, extremely common. Uh, the prevalence in some studies is up to 93%. It is the single most common etiology of school and work absences in adolescent and young adult women. So, you know, when you think about dysmenorrhea, it can be either primary or it can be secondary. For adolescents, the majority, the vast majority of cases are primary. Uh, that is, that it is the production of prostaglandins leading to cramping of the uterine musculature. You need to think about non-primary, that is secondary causes, if dysmenorrhea starts right at the time of menarche or if it starts several years after menarche if the pain becomes progressive, or the pain is persistent despite having appropriate intervention. So primary dysmenorrhea typically occurs six to 24 months after menarche. Again, it is associated with ovulatory cycles, and the first 12 to 24 months after menarche, remember, many are anovulatory cycles. So it starts with ovulation and with the production of prostaglandin F2 alpha. Uh, evaluation in somebody coming in with dysmenorrhea is menstrual history, again, you want to know what the age of menarche is, duration of bleeding, assessment of flow, the interval, we already talked about all the normal values for that. We want to find out what symptoms they have, about whether or not there's progression of these symptoms, uh, obtaining a sexual history, a family history about dysmenorrhea and about some of the secondary causes of dysmenorrhea. Uh, you want to ask, ask about trauma and abuse as well because sometimes young women will present with dysmenorrhea after they've been sexually abused. Um, do an external examination. If the patient is sexually active, um, you should probably do a pelvic examination. And if there's severe progressive pain, you want to do a pelvic examination and or an ultrasound to look for secondary etiologies. Management for primary dysmenorrhea. Um, effective non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. You need to start the NSAIDs at the time of their menses or with the first symptoms that they have of their menses um, because you want to block the production of prostaglandin F2 alpha. Um, I mean, otherwise you're just using the NSAIDs as analgesics. But if you start it early enough, they can actually block the production of prostaglandins. Again, NSAIDs are prostaglandin synthetase inhibitors. 70 to 80 percent will respond to appropriate dosage and timing. If they're sexually active, you can consider putting them on hormonal contraceptives, uh, which are effective. Uh, typically, I start with NSAIDs first unless they're sexually active. Um, 
and after they've gone a couple or three cycles and there's no improvement and they're taking it the right way, you've got to make sure that they're taking it the right way, then I will add the other modality. If the dual therapy fails, then I think about secondary dysmenorrhea. So again, secondary dysmenorrhea, consider it if it starts at the time of menarche or if it starts in the late teen years, the pain is progressive, or they do not respond to appropriate therapy. Differential diagnosis includes endometriosis. And this is where the family history is important. Uh, progressive pain, it's persistent. You can actually have non-cyclic pain with it. Adenomyosis, the menses are heavy, and on examination you feel this large, boggy uterus. Uh, congenital anatomic abnormalities. I would like to say that I've never seen an imperfect hymen being referred into me, but I can't really say that. Um, so, you know, that's why an external examination is important, to look for an imperfect or a fenestrated hymen. Other congenital anatomic, anatomic abnormalities include cervical stenosis um, or the other malformations of the GU tract, cyclic pain from the onset of menarche, and there can be an association with other genital urinary anomalies. Adhesions, particularly if they've um, had curatage for some reason. Interstitial cystitis, uh, made on the basis of a urinalysis and cystoscopy. Pelvic inflammatory disease. And ovarian cyst. Here's a problem with ovarian cysts. Most of the times there's an ultrasound and it shows a dominant follicular cyst, 1.0 centimeters in size. A dominant follicular cyst, 1.5 centimeters in size, is highly unlikely to be the etiology of dysmenorrhea. That is just your plain old cyst that's about to ovulate. Um, so uh, I, when I get a, somebody coming in and they're having recurrent uh, dysmenorrhea because of a physiologic, uh, because of an ovarian cyst, it's usually not the right diagnosis. Amenorrhea. Okay, so there's primary and secondary uh, primary and secondary amenorrhea. Now in this diagnosis, primary means that they've never had a menstrual period by the age of 15. Or you can also make that diagnosis or an associate diagnosis if there's a lack of development of secondary sexual characteristics by the age of 13. Now of great interest is that these are the numbers that are usually given and they really don't entail the fact that onset of puberty has gotten earlier and earlier and it's still not been completely clarified whether or not uh, the late onset of these factors should also be coming down. Secondary amenorrhea is the absence of menses for three or more months. Um, related to secondary amenorrhea is oligomenorrhea, which are fewer than nine cycles per year, cycle length or cycle length greater than 35 days. And the workup for oligomenorrhea is the same as secondary amenorrhea. The caveat is that, again, in the first, especially the first 12 months after menarche, and maybe up to the first 24 months after menarche, cycles can be very, very irregular. Primary uh, amenorrhea, this is a series of patients from Richard Reindoller, looking at 252 patients, and what he found, and this was, again, a, a tertiary center that was doing the evaluation. So he found 43% of the patients that have gonadal dysgenesis, 15% Mullerian dysgenesis, 14% uh, physiologic delay, 7% PCOS, 5% isolated GnRH deficiency, and he commented that that is way higher than you would find in a non-tertiary care center, and a transverse vaginal septum in 3%. For primary amenorrhea, the workup, in addition to a comprehensive history and physical examination, remember, those are your two best diagnostic tools, your history and your physical. Um, in addition to that would be a vaginal ultrasound, uh, a urine HCG, an FSH level. If there is an absent uterus, 
then you would want to obtain a karyotype. Again, thinking about Rheindoller and the gonadal dysgenesis. Secondary amenorrhea, until proven otherwise, is pregnancy. Uh, okay, again, this is Richard Rheindoller's slightly different group of patients. Average age here is 26. Um, and what he found was that in the 262 patients with secondary amenorrhea, the majority uh, had an invariant etiology, with most of them having PCOS. The second leading cause of ovarian is primary ovarian sufficiency, uh, which we're seeing increasingly. For Some of it could be because of um, medications that we're administering, uh, or, um, but you need to be aware of that. Almost as high as ovarian etiologies were hypothalamic amenorrhea, stress, weight loss, eating disorders, systemic illness. Uh, again, this was a tertiary care center, pituitary etiologies in 17%, including prolactinomas and empty cell syndrome, and uh, uterine adhesions in 7%. Again, the most important diagnostic tools are history and physical examination with special attention to signs of hyperandrogenism, and those are acne, moderate severe acne, hirsutism, and hair, uh, hair loss in the scalp. The workup, pregnancy tests, FSH, prolactin, TSH. Uh, consider testosterone and DHAAS, and maybe considering 17 OHP. Um, I've had actually a couple patients with late onset CAH, um, and this young lady, 16 years old, came in with her 6'5 father and her 5'11 mother, and she was 5'2, and she hadn't grown in several years. And she had severe acne, um, she had hirsutism, um, she had clitoral megaly, um, and because she was far shorter than um, the mid-height, mid-parental height would suggest, I did get uh, 17 OH, OHP and did diagnose her with a late onset CAH. Abnormal uterine bleeding is the last topic that we're going to be discussing. And uh, again, this is the artist formerly known as Prince. No, oh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, I'm sorry. The mnemonic is COIN coagulopathies, ovarian dysfunction, PCOS again, endometrials such as PID. PID rarely causes true, I mean, it may be some spotting. It's typically not going to be confused with abnormal uterine bleeding or being, um, or pregnancy related issues. Atrogenic, including birth control pills and anticoagulants, and N, not yet classified. That was a great N, that's a good save. So abnormal uterine bleeding, it's typically occurring at, a, at the ends of a woman's reproductive lifespan. So it's going to be at the start of menses and at the end of menses. And that's because that's when you have anovulatory cycles. But anovulatory cycles are a diagnosis of exclusion. It's because of the prolonged stimulation of the endometrium from unopposed estrogen. So it's the, the woman is experiencing a proliferative endometrium that just continues to grow and grow and grow under the fertilization of the estrogen. And at some point, that estrogen level no longer can support that depth of tissue. And without progesterone around, there's no maturation of the endometrial lining. Um, and you start having irregular breakdown of this lining of the endometrium. If dysfunctional uterine bleeding occurs soon after menarche, or if it's really heavy, consider some of the disorders of hemostasis, specifically things like von Willebrand's disease. This is a very common presentation for von Willebrand's disease, especially if the bleeding is occurring soon after menarche. Glanzmann's thromancenia or bernard soulier disease. Other etiology, thyroid disease typically is going to be hypothyroidism, thrombocytopenia, pregnancy, infection, uh, trauma or foreign body, foreign body typically associated with an incredibly malodorous vaginal discharge or hormonal withdrawal. Management of abnormal uterine bleeding, if it's mild with a stable hemoglobin above 11, 
you can supplement with some iron, give them a menstrual calendar. Uh, the reason with iron is that typically the dietary intake of iron is matched pretty much by the usual blood loss from menses in adolescent women. So if they're having a little bit excess bleeding, they're going to run out of iron. And remember, iron's a necessary cofactor for plate, optimal platelet function. So iron deficiency can cause dysfunction uterine bleeding because the platelets don't work as well, or it can be caused by dysfunction uterine bleeding because you're not able to keep up with the need for iron. Moderate abnormal uterine bleeding, the patient's stable, hemodynamically stable, the hemoglobin's above nine, management as above, plus you add either OCPs or you could um, try 10 days of progestin every month. And the reason that works is that it's allowing the lining of the endometrium to mature and so it's shedding this mature lining rather than this unopposed estrogen. The advantage of the progestins alone are that you interfere less with the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis um, and so that you optimally could perhaps escape this sooner. If they're sexually active then you know it's easy management you just put them on the pill. If it's severe abnormal uterine bleeding um, that's the hemostats are unstable or the hemoglobin is less than nine. Um, you start them on the pill one pill four times a day, you not need to give them an antiemetic because they're going to york up their intestines on that much estrogen. If there's no response to that, they're going to need IV estrogen. IV estrogen is 10 to 100 times the dosage of oral estrogen, so they're going to probably york up on that as well. Um, and after the taper follow-up with three weeks of under, uninterrupted OCPs, you need to warn them that you're giving them a hell of a lot of estrogen so that they may have a, a, a heavier menses than normal when they finally get off the pill. I've included several um, papers here uh, on dysmenorrhea, abnormal uterine bleeding, and uh, delayed sexual development amenorrhea. Thank you for your attention.